Body found sprawled on Seafield Safai Access Road in a pool of blood. No limit set as yet for writing CSEC subjects. Guyana among the highest in the Caribbean in the illicit trade of tobacco. Increased police presence in Safaya following the latest murder. Sheep thieves prowling in Burbies, cattle farmers frustrated. Those were the top headlines for the week ending June 30. Welcome to MTV News Updates Week in Review for the week ending June 30. I am Trisha Ramla. Good afternoon. To begin the news, the lifeless body of a father of five was discovered in a pool of blood on the Seafield Safaya Main Access Road. The police have since arrested one person in connection with the discovery. Details in this Nickel John Doe report. Dead is 49-year-old Trevor Dublin of Sophia, Greater Georgetown. Dublin's lifeless body was found lying in a pool of blood on the main access road leading down into Seafield. According to Divisional Commander Calvin Brutus, it was during a police patrol that Dublin's body was discovered by the ranks. The police already went back to the scene and did a canvassing of the area and that means you walk the area house to house to house and find out in the general area if anybody saw anything. It wasn't fruitful at this moment. We have to go back again to see what other information we can get with respect to what transpired there on that evening. When News Update visited the area this morning, the residents lamented a lack of street lights in that particular area. They added that there is a small stall at the side of the road where young men would frequent, which poses a danger for passers-by. A couple days ago, I started to put one here, but I'm going to put a street light in my yard to my fence, so it will reflect. You see from that corner to there, you can't see yourself. Last night I sit down here, me, this lady over there, we got the shop, and uh, my wife. Where the man will lie down, you can't even see the place from here. How the place is dark, we need street lights, my brother. Yes, it's every night. You got this kick. I'm living here. I live in through the street there. Yeah. And when I come out, I get a catch a taxi for home. Yeah. yeah, catch a taxi. Yeah, right through the street there. Right through the street. Right through the street there, you see the corner there? You see a small stand down there? If you pass every night, anything up to nine o'clock, you see somebody clump up and need it. Uh, two weeks ago, they might hide in a bush, shine out them car taxi man when they pass in. And they might stop here right out and rob them. No police. Divisional Commander Brutus says one person has been arrested. The police alleged that there was a young man there who, upon seeing the police, attempted to run away. They gave chase and arrested him. So, based on his action, the police are suspicious, but there no, there is no evidence at this time linking him to the crime. Dublin leaves to mourn five children and wife. Nikhil John, the reporting for MTV News Update. Can you really profess your innocence after being caught red-handed? This is the case of a Baikoni man after he was busted by police with a quantity of articles which he allegedly stole from a couple on June 25. Find out more from Nickel Jondu. Divisional Commander Calvin Brutus says swift action by ranks of the force have resulted in the capture and arrest of an alleged bandit. The robbery was committed on a couple who were relaxing under a Benab at a popular fun park at Maikoni East Coast, Demerara. We managed to intercept the perpetrator and recover a 9mm Glock with nine matching rounds of ammunition. He's in custody, he assisted us with the investigation. And the articles were already also recovered on his person. Commander Brutus says after the suspect was arrested by the ranks, a search was conducted where the stolen articles were recovered. And we will also have to put him on identification parade to ascertain whether or not he was involved in any other robberies because, you know, criminals, they move from areas to areas and perpetrate their crimes. And to do ballistics on the weapon as well. If it happens to be a stolen weapon from some licensed firearm holder or if the weapon was involved in any other crime anywhere else in the country. So that was something in the near future today that would happen. In a statement by the force, based on intelligence gathered, the 30-year-old suspect was positively identified and is being processed for court. Nikhil John, the reporting for MTV News Update. Divisional Commander Calvin Brutus says the female driver was charged and placed on bail following a fatal accident on the railway embankment on Saturday night. Details in this report. 
That is 36-year-old Deborah Pompey of West Bank Demararo. According to Divisional Commander Calvin Brutus, the driver of the car, Patana Welcome, was charged on Monday, June 26, for driving under the influence of alcohol. She pled not guilty at Sparna Magistrate Court and was placed on $20,000 bail. Matter postponed for August. We also had a post-mortem done on Miss Pompey and the results was as multiple injuries. She died of multiple injuries due to motor vehicle accident. So they were now left to compile the file and send it for advice, which will be done before the week is out and get the way forward in terms of legal advice as to how we should proceed with the matter. The others injured are Rodlin Grace, Shamika Martin, Tishana Hubbard and Saskia Boyer, all of whom were occupants of the car when it crashed into the bridge on the railway embankment at Sapphire. Reports are that a group of females was having a bridal shower as one of the injured persons is getting married. The accident occurred at approximately 23 hours 40 on Saturday night. The women were heading home from Giffan Mall. Persons who live close to where the accident took place explain what they saw subsequently. It was very tragic. Actually, I was watching television when I heard the sound. And when I reached to the window, I saw the car there. But I was trying to understand how it got to that position because the front of the car, it was up on the road there and the bottom was off. The whole front of the car was right off and at that time they had like about three or four cars that were passing so people came out and assisted in getting the, the girls out. After that I found out that it was all female in the car. Um, two of them they got out pretty quickly but the rest I, I guess they were trapped in some kind of way so they had to take out the back seat of the car to get the girls out. The injured women are still being kept in the GPHC for medical care and observation. Nikhil John, the reporting for MTV News Update. As crime continues, two sheep herders are counting their losses after bandits allegedly carted off with several of their flocks during the night. The bandits allegedly waited on the heavy rains to muffle the stungs of the animals before escaping with them. Find out more in this report. Duganday Ramasar during an interview says she was awoken by the songs of her sheep and calf. The woman explained that she woke her husband to check what was taking place because it was raining and the animals' pens were surrounded by water. I not see them, but I hear the trumping in the water because the water big at the back there. So I not see them, but me thought was cow, but not knowing it was men carrying away the sheep there. No, they left four with the, with the um, young calf in the pen. Rami Sora says her husband made a report at the Fort Wellington police station, but no rank came to investigate. This morning they made the report and they went all over the search in the bush. All over they went and search in the bush. They fall in the trench all. My husband and the uncle they left and my son they went and nobody didn't find none. They see the trace last night. They went and search like 12 and after 12 they see the trace but they can't go move forward because they don't know. Meanwhile, another livestock owner who lives at number 30 village, West Coast Burbies, claims that he lost 13 sheep. When News Update asked residents in the area, they said it was raining on Sunday night when the alleged bandits came and stole the animals. Nikhil Jondo reporting for MTV News Update. A man's toe was blown off on Tuesday, June 27, when armed bandits terrorized a La Parfait Harmony family, relieving them of cash and jewelry. Lashana Gomes Cornelius with the horrific details. Still at large are the three men that stormed the home of Saroj Singh and her family, relieving them of cash, jewelry and cellular phones while at gunpoint. The police at the division have related since recovering the getaway vehicle used by the bandits, they have been able to recover several fingerprints, which could soon lead to arrests of the men. The black Nissan car was hijacked by the three suspects moments after they had terrorized Singh and her family, leaving one of the woman's sons with a gunshot wound to the foot. What I'm told, my ranks are dear than their viewing. Some footage. We have indeed, as I said to you, we've viewed those footage 
um, at least one person we, we, we kind of have a, a name. Police have made contact with the victim mm -hmm. and the matters are the investigation. But I can tell you we got prints. All of that has been analyzed at the moment. We are working. Although the family has an installed CCTV camera located at the front of their small grocery shop, at the time of the robbery, that camera was not turned on, related Narendra Narayan. The visibly shaken young man revealed that was an error on their part, but still expressed confidence of the force as they are in the possession of the getaway vehicle used by the bandits. In the meantime, Commander James assured there is sufficient evidence to bring those involved in the crime to justice. Investigations into the matter are still ongoing. Reporting for MTV News Update, Lashana Gomes, Cornelius. Following the stabbing to death of 47-year-old Trevor Dublin of Sophia Greater Georgetown, Divisional Commander Calvin Brutus says patrols have been boosted for that particular area. Find out more in this report. We have a patrol dedicated for Torkin area. And Torkin area includes the, um, the fields, the four fields. Um, part of A coming right through to D field. And a vehicle covers that day and night. We've also instituted a motorcycle patrol that helped to support the four-wheel vehicle patrol. Commander Calvin Brutus says the force is not able to provide security for only one section of Sapphire. However, following a meeting with senior officers within the division, they have decided to have a shift system be in place that would allow for ranks to patrol the area more frequently both day and night. Commander Brutus added that residents have also complained that there is an increase in robberies in Seafield. However, the senior officer differed on the matter. At the police station, we haven't had the reports coming in. Uh, for some reason, persons or victims did not come to the police to report these incidents. Nevertheless, we would not wait until persons come to make those complaints. We have already taken initiative to put police on the ground in Seafield. Um, in general. The divisional commander further added that an inspector will be transferred to the Turkin police station to efficiently and effectively supervise ranks at that station. Because we've had some complaints of the police response time to complaints made at station for other matters and hence we took the decision to raise the level of supervision at Turkin police station. So within the near future we expect to see improvement in the police performance in at Turkin Station. The father of five was discovered in a pool of blood on the main access road leading down into Seafield. The man's body was found during a police patrol in the area on Saturday night. Commander Bruta says one person has been arrested, however the suspect is still at large. Nikhil John, the reporting for MTV News Update. Guyana, Suriname and Trinidad and Tobago are the countries within the Caribbean that have the highest level of illicit trade of tobacco. As such, a one-day conference was planned to discuss how these countries would move forward to address the issue. Find out more details in this report. An official from the British American Tobacco for Central America and the Caribbean says the scale of the illicit trade is difficult to accurately quantify because of its secret and illegal nature. The official added that recent estimates by Global Financial Integrity place the total at US $560 billion for illegal goods and at $2 trillion US dollars if illegal finance is included. We're receiving so many brands. In Central America and the Caribbean market, we have seen more than 200 different brands of cigarettes in our markets. Most of this product is coming from Asia. If you go to the streets of your country, to the retailers, the street hawkers, and you, you take a good look of the, of the brands, you will see the majority of the brands coming from China, coming from India, and other countries around those. Head of Legal and External Affairs at British American Tobacco Caribbean, Christopher Brown, says the trade in illegal cigarettes has become a global issue with the Caribbean 
being affected in a negative way. He noted that customs and law enforcement leaders of the three countries, namely Guyana, Trinidad and Tobago and Suriname, need to understand the nature of the illegal trade. He added that without these key stakeholders to act in a collaborative way, they would not be able to break the supply chain of those who may want to trade illicit tobacco products. Increasingly we are finding that the trade is a part of the global organized criminal enterprise. So it is not only a challenge for governments in terms of their revenues, which is a very significant issue because the illicit trade robs the governments of um, millions of dollars in terms of um, tax revenues, but it's also increasingly becoming a security problem. Nikhil John, the reporting for MTV News Update. Overtopping of the East Demerara Water Conservancy has affected hundreds of rice and cash crop farmers on the west coast of Burbese. During a visit to the area, it was revealed that the water has been overflowing for several weeks now. Find out more from Nikhil Jondu. Rice farmers are complaining bitterly that the Mahaika Maikonia Bari Agricultural Development Authority has failed to render an explanation to them about the increase in the water level on their farmlands. The farmers, during a recent visit to the area, say they have learned that the water in the East Demerara Water Conservancy has reached its maximum level, thus the excess is being drained directly into the main irrigation canal. The irrigation canal water would be used to wet the farmlands during the early stages of the rice growth. Many spots have given away and water is going now from this main canal into the Abari. They have let out the, the tail end, sending, sending the water into the Abari. And because of this, the Abari keep rising. I agree that rain has fell and flood the place. But this problem we are facing now is a man-made disaster through mismanagement of the government and the MME. Because they had failed to maintain the spillway in the conservancy. They're using the main irrigation canal as a drainage to release the conservancy. Meantime, cash crop farmers are also complaining that the main canal which drains the community is heavily silted, thereby causing severe damages to their crops. Yeah, well, everybody knows it's rain, but if the trench been clean, and the water run out, when, when the, 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 the water got go till a time, road signal, and then when the, um, the, 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 the sluice close down, estate a pump over. The trench block up right through, if you take the sole trench and you go over the road, eh? right through, block up over right through. Oh, and then, then here, no? they clean all the other trenches so on the machine from Hope Tong Island Trench to excavate and take one room, emergency work and they left it, this is not emergency. Since the last time the water is up to now, it's still there here up to now. The train come and catch them back and raise them back again. Nikhil John, the reporting for MTV News Update. The Ministry of Education is set to begin consultations between parents and teachers for the Ministry's automatic promotion, No Child Left Behind policy. Chief Education Officer Marcel Hudson said that the Ministry of Education has already been focusing on the issue of automatic promotions in schools. Hudson said that consultations will begin to ensure that a decision taken will be in the interest of everyone. That certainly is on the cards in terms of us um, making some decisions in relation to that that will be beneficial to everyone. We don't want to um, make decisions um, where we find ourselves in a situation where we're regretting decisions that we make. So I think the whole thing is that we looking for unanimity. The issue of the automatic promotion policy, no child left behind, is still a controversial one. In 2014, former Minister of Education Priya Manik Chand had introduced this policy in schools. The government was criticized for this move and later in the year, the ministry allegedly said that the policy will not continue. However, to date it continues. In grade 10, students must pass five subjects, including mathematics and English, to be promoted to fifth form. The European Union has approved over $20 billion in grants for Guyana to improve the livelihoods of people across the country. With climate change being on the front burner of the European Union, 
$22 billion was invested in sea defense challenges across the country. This is according to European Union Ambassador Jorni Vidadic. From our side, I can, I can confirm that we are very much committed to our cooperation and the results of the investments are visible. The flood protection is better, less houses are damaged, the protected area has been considerably extended, there are more sluices, better drainage system. Through the European Union, grants were invested in a number of divisions inclusive of civil society in addressing anti-discrimination and human rights issues. Forestry protection, water, energy, administrative reforms were among the divisions invested through grants. The EU-Guyana partnership is very dynamic and successful. It provides real change for citizens. It's not bureaucratic, but it's addressing direct needs of the citizens. The 2017 year is crucial, as key contracts will be signed and many important projects in all areas will kick fully off. Noting with optimism, Verdic says with ongoing dialogues, the projects are expected to force the progress. Grants from the European Union are directly injected into the Treasury on the basis of an agreed sector policy. Sandy Ramutar for MTV's News Update. No more grants are expected to be invested in the sugar reform sector through the European Union. However, the possibility of such grants exists if the government requests from the EU. European Union Head of Cooperation, Christoph Stock, says monies are being injected directly to the Treasury, which is then managed by the government. However, the European Union is responsible for assessing the performance indicators as part of a monitoring process to ensure projects are not flawed. But I mean, the indicator uh, was not how much sugar is produced or something. That's not an indi indicator for us. But, but they are uh, reform indicators. How the reform is done, it's a uh, responsibility of the government. Upon perusing the indicators, the European Union will determine whether for the funds will be invested in a specific sector. The payment was executed in uh, two and 2016, uh, so uh, only when we have confirmation that the indicators were met, uh, then we release, uh, so to say, the next branch. $5.4 billion was invested last year as a support measure to the ailing sugar reform sector from the EU. The disbursement came at a time when the sugar industry was evidently in a financial crisis. Sandy Ramutar for MTV's News Update. The Ghana Sugar Corporation had early announced that the world market price for sugar has plummeted and had also called on sugar workers to ensure production is maximized. However, the Ghana Agricultural and General Workers Union sees this as another sordid justification to launch further assaults on the sugar workers. Over the past six months, the world market price for sugar has dropped significantly, with the price presently standing at US $12.66 per pound. This is according to a statement from the Guyana Sugar Corporation. According to them, the low prices will not assist the corporation's fragile financial position. As such, poor liquidity will continue to pose a serious challenge in the upcoming second crop. However, the Guyana Agriculture and General Workers Union believes such statements are used as a despicable justification to launch further assaults on the sugar workers. Gao also pointed out that Gaisuko's sales to the various markets are contractual and negotiated between the corporation and the respective buyers. The union says the statement fails to inform that the world market is a residual market that is far from being reflective of the true cost production globally. Sandy Ramutar for MTV's News Update. As the government has not acted entirely on the recommendations emanating from the Commission of Inquiry into the state of the sugar industry, former chair of that commission has revealed his displeasure. Vibert Parvatan affirms that COIs should be duly interpreted and acted on and not cast aside in archives as it holds volumes of recommendations for the respective sectors. Here is Sandy Ramutar. 
Pointing to the imminent oil and gas industry, former chairman of the Public Service Commission, Major General Norman McLean, says potential riches will not solve problems. McLean believes the country should use those existing riches to prop up the failing rice and sugar industry. And you know, Guyana is on a springboard, in my view. And you know, when you're on a springboard, one stage it goes down before it gets to flip up. And so we are in the down phase at this stage of our game. But we will flip up because of all the natural resources which we have and how we manage what we have. Reflecting on his chairmanship of the Commission of Inquiry into the state of the sugar industry, Vibert Proverton says the voluminous aspects were being written only to be archived later. According to him, Commission of Inquiry reports are usually followed with a conventional tribute and gratitude. It will be beneficial for planners and administrators in Guyana. Before venturing on to many new things, to simply go back and look and read, understand, interpret what has been done and not to reinvent the wheel. So many instructive things are there, things which can be useful today in interpretation and in application. On the other hand, three more of the existing sugar estates will be subject to closure under the coalition government. Meanwhile, there is an imminent oil and gas industry which is expected to create riches in 2020. Sandy Ramutar for MTV's News Update. After being in existence for more than 100 years, the Mayor and City Council is now looking for a new area to facilitate burial in Georgetown since the largest burial site, New Prantier Cemetery, is filled. Details in this report. The Lira Printer Cemetery, which has been in existence for more than a century, has been officially filled. During an interview with the mayor of Georgetown, Patricia Chase Green, she said that the council has a tripartite committee that is looking at the ongoing issue. The mayor said there is a possible area that has been identified to facilitate burial in Georgetown. Well, the tripartite committee is set to meet tomorrow, and when they meet tomorrow, they're that it will be one of the issues they will be dealing with because that has a cost to clear and to prepare that ground for burial. The mayor said that the committee will look at the necessary adjustments, costs and other aspects relating to a new area for a cemetery for Georgetown citizens. We were tasked with the responsibility of looking for adequate space in the cemetery. There is a portion identified just behind um, the further east to the end more martyrs that has to be cleared that will also because there are very large palm trees there Le Repentier cemetery was first established in march 1861 subsequently a road was constructed through the cemetery to link the penitents with the lodge wortmanville and working rust the first person entombed at the Le Repentier cemetery was antonio gonzalez on march 15 1861 Vendors plying their trade on the monopolist market tarmac will be forced to vacate the area in about two months to facilitate infrastructural work for the east coast of Demerara four-lane road expansion project. Sandy Ramatar with the details. Vendors occupying the Monrepo market tarmac have unanimously agreed to be removed to facilitate the four-lane road expansion project. This is according to Chairman of the Monrepo La Reconnaissance Neighborhood Democratic Council, Ayub Muhammad. Well, we have decided tentatively on a site and they, uh, and they are all in agreement that it's, it's the most suitable site. So we have some people who, have, uh, moved, who are living on the resort. This follows a meeting with 350 vendors at the NEC on June 22. However, infrastructural works are on pause as the council is presently working to remove three squatters from the location where the vendors will be temporarily placed, according to Mohammed. Because we are going, we are going to, to fill in the trench and we'll build a big concrete drain too, for the drainage. And then the whole site along with the, with the trench, the filled in trench and the, the bit of reserve that is there, we'll uh, do in the time. In the meantime, the vendors will be subject to notices allowing them to get in preparatory mode two months prior to the initial removal. The vendors who plied their trade on the tarmac were forced to remove the facilitated infrastructural work on the east coast of the Mararo four-lane road extension project. 
Sandy Ramutar for MTV's News Update. Intensive discussions are ongoing between the Education System Committee and head teachers from senior and junior secondary schools to propose a limitation of Caribbean secondary school examination subjects being written by students. The Ministry of Education has been under some pressure for proposing to cap the amount of subjects students are allowed to write at a Caribbean secondary school exam, CSEC. The Chief Education Officer Marcel Hudson said that there was a discussion at the Education System Committee with head teachers of both senior secondary and junior secondary schools in the country. Hudson said that the EUC has noticed that students are given thin lines to do many subjects within one year. There is not a cap as such to say that we are not, the children are not permitted to write as many subjects as, as they, they want to write. The real issue is that we have a vast amount of our children not matriculating. The ministry's focus is on the two compulsory and essential subjects, mathematics and English language. And one of the things that we've discovered is rather than spreading um, ourselves very thin and um, not passing mathematics and English, we will uh, organize ourselves in such a way and the timetable that our children will be given more time to be engaged in, in, in activities related to English language and mathematics. In a letter sent to public secondary schools, it was said that a ministry is proposing to limit the amount of subjects CSEC students are allowed to write. It was proposed that senior school students write eight subjects and the junior school students write six subjects. Over the years, the passes for mathematics and English have been low and the ministry is concerned about this problem. In Barbados, there is a limit of eight subjects to be written at this examination. That's a wrap for MTV News Updates Week in Review. The newscast can be viewed online on MTV's Facebook page and also on our YouTube channel. Join us Tuesday, July 4 for another edition of MTV News Update. On behalf of our news team, I am Trisha Ramla, thanking you for watching.